Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Uh, my website's jasonbirdspreacher.com I was just reading this uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, Beyond New Testament Theology uh, by Heike, Heike uh, Reisen, Reisen then, uh, Professor of New Testament Exegesis at the University of Helsinki. And basically it's a history of New Testament theology. He, he looks at um, Bowers, uh, F.C. Bauer, D.F. Strauss, um, goes right through to Boltman, uh, even into modern times, right up to N.T. Wright, etc. And uh, I just want to read uh, page 34. starting from 33 on uh, a scholar that uh, I value quite a lot uh, so this this scholar here uh, Adolf uh, Schlatter my uh, hermeneutics method of interpreting the Bible uh, is influenced by Adolf Schlatter Adolf Schlatter uh, was very strong on the historical grammatical method um, so that's one of his books here so this is what he says uh, this this guy the turn of the century conservative church exegesis tried to come the overcome history of religious work either by rejecting its results or by trying to make them serve a conservative point to, point of view in the modified form. The former strategy found a representative in Schlatter. Um, Schlatter often receives a fair amount of tension when the history of New Testament theology is outlined, not only from the more conservative side, which is understandable, but also from other quarters, including Bultmann and Kaisman. This is a little surprising, for obviously Schlatter's actual New Testament theology remains in the fetter of dogmatics. A certain next essential touch in that Schlatter connects the thoughts of the men of the New Testament closely with their life is not enough to establish congeniality with Bultmann, much less to make him appear of the later as a biblical theologian. Some of his presuppositions alone, e.g. he uses the Gospel of John as a source for preaching of Jesus without the slightest reserve, mark Schlatter unmistakably as a figure from a bygone age so does his insistence on the theological unity of the New Testament. Schlatter distinguishes in principle between historical and dogmatic work and defends this distinction against a still more conservative view. The prime virtue of a historian says, is the capacity for sight, the ability to observe objective, objectivity, the given facts in the text, a complete separation of history from dogmatics is, however, impossible. The historian must give room for the dogmatician in himself too. It is only the dogmatician in us who supplies the historian with the capacity for making judgments through which he distinguishes between what is possible and what is not, between what is the outline of history and produces the effects as what is dead. This is uh, his quote in Adolf Schlatter. He writes, this writer, uh, This is a valid hermeneutical insight, and the demand that scholars ought not to overlook their own presuppositions is justified. But in Schlatter's actual working out of his New Testament theology, the dialectical relationship uh, he posits between the historical and the dogmatic approach tends to lead to the clear preponderance of the later. The scholar's own faith is considered to be presupposition of true objectivity. Indeed, Schlatter argues for his historical way of conceiving the task on thoroughly biblicist grounds. Such a viewpoint secures us, though not infallibly of course, against producing a mixture of what scripture says and what the church teaches. This is, he's saying what Schlatter's view is. Or a mixture of the Bible and our own religious opinions. Schlatter defends the limitation of New Testament theology to the canonical writings. He tries to substantiate this decision historically, but writes as if the early church had unanimously arrived at the present form of the canon. He goes far as to claim that presentation in which quotations from the Epistle of James 
and Ignatius, the Didache and the pastoral epistles are all mixed up together, cannot give us genuine knowledge. If a scholar does not understand this, it is because the notion of the Christ is without significance for him. Schlatter indeed adopts a very polemical attitude towards liberals and to the history of religious school, accusing these scholars of the writing of fiction and of com combining a historical presentation with polemic against New Testament Christianity. Yet his own presentation of New Testament theology contains much that can only be regarded as fanciful. The dogmatician in this particular historian, in this particular historian, an advocate of imperial observation makes him capable of seeing some strange things and not of seeing, and not of seeing some obvious ones. Schlatter's New Testament theology is, in essence, his systematic theology, opaque in the construction of its argument and often presented in a rather mediative manner. If the work is understood in this way, it can even be appreciated. What applied what appealed to Boltman in Schlatter's enterprise was above all the latest contention that the New Testament that the men of the New Testament frustrate the attempt to separate the act of thinking from the act of living. Here indeed is a salutary emphasis on the non intellectual aspects reflected in the New Testament. New Testament theology certainly has to do with knowledge obtained from the New Testament, but this knowledge is associated with both a, as cause and as effect with the Christian experience of its authors. Schlatter is actually in agreement with liberal and history of religious scholars when he asserts that the impulses which drove Paul are far more important than the formula which he invented about the purpose of the law, the death of Christ, and the justification of believers, and that the power of men of the New Testament did not consist solely in their thoughts. Uh, I could go on and he just, it basically it, it's quite negative uh, critique of uh, Adolf Schlatter. A couple of points. Number one is the arrogance of the academy. There is a great arrogance within the academy. There has been an arrogance within the academy for over since the Enlightenment. This kind of uh, attitude to towards uh, evangelical scholars looking down at them as if they're not uh, scholarly as them. Um, to say that Adolf Schlatter's work is his dogmatic theology uh, in his New Testament theology shows the arrogance again of this scholar. Uh, Adolf Schlatter had a very thorough desire to get to the what the actual Bible taught and he had a methodology and that methodology he carefully outlined and wrote extensively on why he was going down that particular point of view. He recognised that within biblical scholarship, within New Testament uh, theology in particular, that there were various theories, and these theories that people were using, like Harnack and later people like Bultmann, these theories that they had in investigating theology and history really were biases, biases and those biases were being used as the hermeneutic to interpret the data. So what he was saying is that he, his bias, his uh, particular presupposition, are uh, the better presupposition in order to get to access what the actual New Testament was teaching. Um, and that comes to my next point, is that there's, there is a bit of a... So just to recap there, but basically, um, this guy is saying, you know, um, Adel Schlatter, the scholar, is biased. And because he's biased, is he, he was pretending to do New Testament theology, but really it was dogmatic theology put into his New Testament theology. That's a, just a complete sham look at Schlatter. That is a ad hominem against Schlatter, and it shows you... How some kind, how, how a lot of scholarship in the academy can be so biased, so uh, critical, and so unfair towards evangelical scholars, and you've got to be aware of that, because Schlatter did incredible uh, work in trying to find out what the actual text of the New Testament was saying in terms of theology. Uh, more than anybody else, he really sifted 
the New Testament to find out what the New Testament actually taught rather than imposing um, various um, presuppositions on the text. And also he had a right to have presuppositions like that the, te the, the New Testament was had a unity. He had a, he had a right to that presupposition. He, he was able to argue his position as opposed to the academy at the time uh, who took a different position because they were built on their own presuppositions and he didn't agree with their presuppositions. They were not as objective as they claimed to be. As, as time has found out, Harnick, many of Harnick's views are out of date, many of Bultmann's views are out of date, but the work of Schlatter is still enduring. You know, in fact, <coughs> modern scholarship has not caught up with Schlatter yet. There still needs to be massive uh, resurgence within the West uh, in studying Schlatter's work. And uh, that's, that's not coming yet. We've had a biography of Schlatter, a couple of biographies. We've had a couple of monographs. But we have yet to see uh, PhDs coming out, uh, which need to be coming out, exploring many aspects of Schlatter's work. And that shows you the paucity and the intellectual barrenness of the academy at the present time. That that one of the greatest scholars of the uh, end of the 19th, early 20th century is still to this day had an injustice done, and the research on this guy is 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 nowhere near enough what it should be you have um i think uh i think it's yarbra um you have yarbra and you have one or two others that have done lectures on on schlatter but uh you know you look at people like karl bart you look at people like boltman People like that have had tons of PhDs written about them, tons of monographs and books and lectures. But Schlatt has been neglected and it's just an outrage in the academy that that's the case. And there needs to be a resurgence of research on Adolf Schlatter. Okay, so so basically, you know, the, this kind of scholar like this is just a typical of the academy, biased um, to the point of, you know... It, you, you could tell that this guy's never read much of, of Adolf Schlatter. You only have to just read a couple of pages of Adolf Schlatter and be impressed with his scholarly work. The next thing uh, I want to say is there needs to be a resurgence, a renaissance of Christian scholarship within the academy. Um, and what I mean by that is the academy, uh, in terms of New Testament theology, in terms of uh, historical Jesus studies... And, and, and not just in, in history, in, in the history of Christianity, but in, in all the disciplines. But I'm going to just focus at the moment on biblical, uh, on New Testament theology and on um, historical Jesus studies. Um, there is no one objective criteria that we have. There is only uh, various groups, various individuals who take criteria for investigating history and then they use that criteria in their own way i mean i've read a, a phd on this i've read a phd on looking at the criteria of historical jesus studies looking at dominic crossing looking at nt Wright. so i've I've, re I've read recent research on this and there is no real uh we're, we're told that there's this objective criteria but the fact of the matter is, every scholar is using the criteria in historical Jesus studies in the wrong way, in the wrong way of interpreting. And throughout the history of uh, crit crit uh, Christianity, uh, the study of Christianity since the Enlightenment in the Academy, uh, looking at the origins of Christianity, there has been, and, and, and this has to be faced, there has not been the objectivity there. It has been pre full of presuppositions. You know, Reynan had, had a view of the romantic, romantic Jesus. You know, Schweizer had the eschatological Jesus. Everybody's had their own presuppositions 
when they've come to the table of examining the life of Jesus or the New Testament. Boltman had theories of community, etc., uh, coming to understand uh, the origins of Christianity. So what that means is, is that we, we, we need to stop pretending that there's this objectivity in the academy. And we need to say, we, we need to come out, scholars need to come out and say, you, you know what, I'm doing scholarship from a Christian point of view. I'm doing it on the basis of my presuppositions as a Christian. And I can justify my presuppositions. My presuppositions give me a better foundation for doing scholarship than your presuppositions. But in the academy there is this uh, pretense. That there are many scholars that try to pretend, try to give the illusion that they're objective. And they're not objective. They are so biased it's unbelievable. So we need to throw off the shackles and just say, look, there's a lot of bias going everywhere. We're not as objective as we make ourselves to be. We're going to do a renaissance looking at theology, looking at historical Jesus studies, looking at early Christianity from a historical point of view. And we're going to do it from a Christian point of view. We're going to use our presuppositions because our presuppositions... Uh, our Trinitarian perspective gives us a better basis for historical inquiry. For example, um, why should we investigate history? The Trinity shows us that we're relational. History is a relational aspect of our reality. So the Trinity gives us a foundation for looking into historical knowledge, to find historical knowledge. Uh, that God is sovereign and in control of history. Why should we go to history? We can find meaning and um, and. Uh, purpose in history our belief in God and who he is gives us a basis for meaning in history so we have the right presuppositions we have the right foundation so let's stop pretending that we're all objective because we're not and then we need to bring it into science we need to bring it into philosophy we need to bring it into all areas of uh, the academic life we need to come with a Christian perspective and not be ashamed of doing that all right so I hope that's been a blessing to you basically this video is to say number one the academic world needs to do more work on Adolf Schlatter in biblical scholarship okay it's an absolute disgrace that the Academy has neglected Adolf Schlatter it needs to change it needs to change fast number two Academic scholarship is biased. Let's stop pretending mm -hmm. as theologians. Let's stop pretending in the academy, in the universities, in, in, in the colleges, in the theological seminaries. There is no objectivity there. There is only bias. You have feminist theologians, gay theorist theologians. Uh, uh, you have uh, Arminian theologians. You have reformed theologians. You have secular theologians. There's a bias there. Let's, pre let's stop pretending and let's start being open about our presuppositions and then let's talk about whether our presuppositions are the best presuppositions for doing the work that we're doing. And let us not be ashamed to build a theology, a biblical theology or a historical inquiry or a philosophical treatise or even a scientific treatise. Let's not be ashamed to use the Christian perspective on these things. We, we, we're never going to take back the West if we don't take back the mind we're never going to take back the mind unless we bring a Christian perspective to these disciplines if you go on John Frame's website Poitras, if you go on John Wayne's website John Frame's website you can find uh, his colleague Poitras, I think it is uh, and he's done uh, a biblical view of mathematics a biblical view of logic you know there's a good the theologian uh, a good place to start, a good place to start in, in working at a Christian perspective in these disciplines. All right, thank you for listening. I, I recommend a book for you. I recommend a book. I recommend this book. It's called Philosophy and the Christian Faith by Colin Brown. Uh, it's published by IVP and it, it's a really good introduction mm -hmm. to the history of Western philosophy and uh, it'll help you to think about this issue about presuppositions and about coming at scholarship in a, in a more Christian perspective. 
Um, Dyer Wood, uh, the Dutch theologian and philosopher, is another example. Um, the another exa uh, who you can like learn from, um, and who else is there? Uh, Cornelius van Til, Francis Schaeffer. Um, I'm trying to think of who else is there. Sorry about this. People like Alvin Plantinga. Um, yeah, uh, Kuiper, Abraham Kuiper, um, Herman Bavink. He's a theologian, but Kuiper from a reformed uh, perspective. Uh, so yeah, so I recommend this book. I'll give you some names of philosophers and theologians. Basically, um, this is a video for theologians who are who are working in the academy, or historians, or philosophers. Uh, and I'm just challenging you. It's time to take the gloves off. It's time to reclaim the West from a Christ and and part of that is to start intellectually. And if you're going to claim the West intellectually, you've got to stop being ashamed of being a Christian and start doing your scholarship from a Christian perspective. And the other thing as well, a challenge to the secular academy in, bi in biblical and theological studies, you need to start re-examining um, some of the more conservative scholars of the past, like Theodore Zahn, like uh, Adolf Schlatter, and, do, and, 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 re, and, and put right the injustice that the Enlightenment has done against these scholars and give them more credent, credit and credence than you have done because of your bias against anti-supernaturalism that has happened over the last 300 years. Thank you for listening and God bless you.